Hello, and welcome to a crash course on boats, specifically their physics and some practical factors. Disclaimer, no one on the Innovar team is an expert about boats, but we thought it would be nice if we provided a rundown on boat-related information in a compact manner, instead of having you research a ton of different websites about it. However, we have provided some links and resources in the description box below if you want to read further about any of the topics in this video. In this video, we'll be covering five different factors that affect how people make boats. Buoyancy, balance, material, environment, and purpose, as well as taking a look at a case study, namely the Titanic. First, we'll be covering buoyancy. This is one of the more important topics because buoyancy tells you whether or not your boat will float or sink. Buoyant force is defined as the upward force exerted by any fluid upon a body placed in it. The Archimedes principle can help us calculate the amount of buoyant force placed upon an object. The principle basically states that buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the object and can be represented by this formula. F of B is equal to P multiplied by V of F multiplied by G. Or, buoyant force is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid displaced times the acceleration due to gravity. One thing I'm going to stress is to keep in mind that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, not the object's weight or volume, because an object does not need to be fully submerged in a fluid for buoyant force to be applied. It can be partially submerged as well. To elaborate on the previous slide, I'm going to show you how to go from the buoyant force formula to the Archimedes principle. In the top left hand side, we have what we want to do, the buoyant force equation turning into the Archimedes principle. On the left hand side, we have our givens. F of B, which is the buoyant force, P, which is the density of the displaced fluid, and also equal to M of F, which is the mass of the fluid, and over V of F, which is the volume of the fluid. Then we have V of F, which is the volume of the displaced fluid, G, which is acceleration due to gravity, and W of F, which is the weight of the displaced fluid, which is also equal to the mass of the fluid times acceleration due to gravity. So how do we solve this problem? Let's start with our buoyant force equation. We've written it down on the right hand side. Then we're going to substitute m of f over v of f into the position where p is. After we've done that, we can see that there are two v's, one on the top of the, as the numerator and one on the bottom as the denominator. We can cancel those out as those as v of f over v of f would equal to 1, and 1 multiplied by anything would just be that anything. Now that we know that, we get m of f times g. As we can see on the left hand side, we know the weight of the displaced fluid is also equal to m of f multiplied by g. And there we go. We can substitute w f into the place of m, m of f times g, and we get buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Let's try an example. If you plunge a basketball with a radius of 12 centimeters beneath the surface of a swimming pool until half the volume of the basketball is submerged, what is the amount of buoyant force on the ball due to water? So let's walk through this. What are we given? We're given the radius, which is 12 centimeters or 0.12 meters. We're given the density, which is 1000 kilograms per meters cubed which is the density of water, um, you just kind of need to know that, and gravity, which is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared, on Earth at least. What do we want to know? These are our unknowns. V of F, which is the volume of the fluid, we don't know that, and F of B, which is the buoyant force, we also want to know that. Our formulas, which we need, are the buoyant force equation and the volume equation. So the volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Um, we're going to divide it in half because only half is submerged. Let's solve for the volume of the displaced fluid first. As you can see in the top right corner, I've written out the formula. As we know before, the volume of the displaced fluid is equal to half the basketball, which is also equal to 4 over 3 pi r cubed divided by 2. We can simply solve this by plugging in r into the position of r in the formula and then solving for the answer. After we go through the steps, we can see that the volume of the displaced fluid is equal to 1.152 times 10 to the negative 3 pi meters cubed or 
about 3.619 times 10 to the negative 3 meters cubed. Next, let's solve for buoyant force. As we know, buoyant force is equal to density times the volume of the fluid times the acceleration due to gravity. Since we have already solved for the volume of the fluid, we can simply plug in the values. We get 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed times 1.152 times 10 to the negative 3 pi meters cubed times 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, the meters cubed cancel out and simply equal 1, so we don't need to think about that anymore. We plug in those values into a calculator and we get 35.47 kilograms per meters per second squared. 1 kilogram meters per second squared is equal to 1 newton. So then we can get 35.47 newtons. Therefore, the amount of buoyant force on the ball due to water is about 35.47 newtons. Determining if an object floats is pretty simple. If the weight of the fluid displaced is greater than the weight of the object, then it floats. If the weight of the fluid is less than the object, then it sinks. Let's try another problem. If you want to solve the problem yourself, press pause. Find the buoyant force on 4 times 10 to the negative 4 meters cubed of iron immersed in water. The answer will be revealed in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Here's the solution. Did you get it right? If so, great job. If not, keep working at it. We believe in you. Press pause to look over the solution. Next, we'll be covering balance. Balance is important because, well, it keeps your boat upright. There are two parts to the balance of a ship that you should know. The first is the center of gravity, which is an imaginary point in a body of matter where, for convenience, the total weight of the body is thought to be concentrated. It can be located at the geometric center of the body, usually in a symmetrical object, or can be located somewhere else, such as in an asymmetrical object which can have its center of gravity some distance away from the geometric center. Furthermore, in hollow bodies or irregularly shaped objects, the center of gravity might occur in a space, not on the physical material of the body. For example, in the hull of a ship, which is the watertight bottom of a ship or boat that is usually hollow to make the boat lighter. The second is the center, center of buoyancy, which is just the center of gravity of the water the ship displaces. For the boat to be stable, the center of gravity must be lower than the center of buoyancy, which usually occurs when both centers are on the same vertical line. In the image, the round rectangle represents the ship. The dotted line in the center of it is called the metacenter, which is the vertical line that intersects the center of gravity and center of mass. We can see in the first image that the ship is stable, as the center of gravity is directly below the center of buoyancy. In the second image, we see the hull tilting. The center of gravity is in the same position to the hull, so long as nothing inside has changed, like cargo moving, and the center of buoyancy moves to fit the changed volume of water displaced by the hull. This creates a writing torque that tries to move the hull upright again. However, if the hull tilts too much, the center, center of buoyancy will move below the center of gravity, where the two forces create a movement that works in the same direction, causing the boat to capsize, as seen in image 3. So basically, the main point of balance is that if or when you ever make a boat, to make sure that the structure of your boat is stable enough to avoid capsizing. The last three factors of boat building, material, environment, and purpose, are less physics related and more practical factors, which are still very important. When selecting materials for the boat, you need to keep in mind the weight of the material, because it will affect buoyancy. Something else to note is that material selection is affected by the surroundings and the purpose. For example, some surroundings, such as cold weather, make certain metals more brittle. So if you know the boat will be traveling through cold water, make sure that your material can handle it. The purpose of a boat is defined as what the boat is designed to do. Usually boats are designed for either speed or weight. For example, a speedboat compared to a cargo ship. The speedboat is obviously smaller and lighter than the car cargo ship. However, we can also notice that the speedboat is more streamlined compared to the cargo ship's large volume, which as we know is due to buoyancy. In honor of Valentine's Day, an Innovire team member decided it would be a good idea to use the Titanic as a case study. As many of you know, the Titanic sank, but what some of you may not know is why. Obviously, it did not sink due to a lack of knowledge about the physics involved, as the large luxury ship was able to float. 
But the ship's engineers ignored many of the practical factors and did not take precautions to avoid the sinking. Pieces of the ship's hull that were salvaged in the wreck suggest that the ship broke due to brittle fracture, which is the sudden and rapid cracking of a material under stress, with little to no deformation when the material exhibited little to no wear and tear before the fracture occurred. Think wooden board breaking when it gets karate chopped. Brittle fracture is caused by an impact at an extremely high speed, low temperature, and high sulfur content. Just before midnight on April 14, 1912, the hull of the Titanic was ruptured when it hit an iceberg because it had been traveling at 42.6 kilometers per hour in cold waters with a hull that had a very high sulfur content even for its time. Due to engineering flaws in the hull's design, the compartments below were flooded, which soon led to its downfall at 2.20 a.m. on April 15, 1912. All in all, the lesson of the Titanic is to not build a giant luxury ship with bad materials and poor engineering. Thank you so much for watching, and we hope you learned more about boats from this crash course video. If you're interested, we've linked some websites in the description box below for further study. Like, comment, and subscribe to our channel for more, and make sure to follow us on our social media. We've linked that down below too. Again, thank you so much, stay safe, wear a mask, and we hope to see you at our future events.